The information hearing for the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee will come to order. Uh, members, today we are hosting an informational meeting on Senate File 15. Senator Osmick, uh, welcome to the committee and please present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate File 15 is commonly referred to as the Digital Right to Repair Bill. Uh, we will be, for the purposes of this informational hearing, we'll be working off of the A3 amendment. The original that was in uh, on file for uh, Senate File 15 is not the version that I am going to be, that I'm pursuing and working on. Uh, Digital Right to Repair is a bill to help Minnesota become uh, more on the front line of being able to save products from going into, a dis going into landfills. Uh, this bill happens to be one that uh, Senator Marty and I, strangely enough, uh, very, we have very diverse viewpoints, but very much agree upon. I believe that we have small businesses in Minnesota that could be very helped by this bill. Uh, we're finding out more and more with our equ uh, electronic equipment that uh, manufacturers are interfering with the repair uh, at independent facilities or perhaps uh, not providing as much information necessary so that we as consumers can either repair our own electronic equipment or in some cases take it to a location that, is that specializes in these repairs uh, and, and go to a place of our own choosing rather than where the manufacturer wants us to go. Senate File 15 as amended uh, would provide a playing field where these independent businesses would be able to provide those services and have less interference by poison pills uh, or proprietary uh, use or uh, not, not being able to have the tools necessary or the schematics necessary to make these repairs. So uh, ultimately making them less valuable and even setting them into a landfill. Uh, so I do have testifiers on the list, five of them, and to be, uh, I, I hope to be brief with them and stay on schedule. Uh, we were trying to do this in 20 minutes and then take questions from you for the, for the panel for 10 minutes. As I discussed with the chair, uh, I'd like to ask then the first two testifiers, uh, Gay, Gordon Byrne, and Amanda LaGrange to come up and provide testimony. Thank you, Senator Osmick, and you are correct. We will have 20 minutes of testimony in support of the bill and then 10 minutes of questioning, and then we will have 20 minutes uh, of testimony against the bill and 10 minutes of questioning. So if your two first two testifiers would come forward, and if the other two would be ready to come forward. So welcome, uh, Ms. Gordon Byrne and uh, Ms. LaGrange. And if you would please identify yourself for the record, and then whoever wants to go first, start. Uh, Gay Gordon Byrne, I'm the Executive Director of the Repair Association. And I'm Amanda LaGrange, the CEO of Tech Dump and Tech Discounts. If you would like to move forward. Yes, I, I think um, that would probably be good. Um, I'm here to talk about what the bill is and give you some context <clears throat> as to why it's here and the reason that it has the clauses that it does. Um, other people will testify about the impact of the bill on their businesses and their lives, so I will not be addressing any of the specific details. The first thing I want to point out is the bill is not directed at any particular industry. It's directed at essentially a failure of contract law to anticipate what's been happening in the marketplace with um, modern equipment that has complications of embedded software or software licensed um, products that are added to the hardware product itself. And what we found is that over the past dozen years or so in, in various industries that people are buying equipment, like you and me, we go to the store, we buy something, and then when we bring it home, we turn it on and we click to accept something. We don't actually ever read that agreement seems like kind of a waste of time since you can't negotiate it. And then we um, go along until we find out there was a good reason we should have read the agreement or possibly not bought the product. And the problem is specifically one that the contracts, these little embedded agreements, are not there for the benefit of the consumer. They're there so that the manufacturer can exert a level of control post-purchase that doesn't belong in a purchase. So if we already have the legal framework for doing a purchase, and that's supposed to be a complete agreement, and then we also have the way to protect intellectual property through copyright law, and those are called licenses. There is no merged status. 
It's one or the other. If you have a license that's implied or referenced or included and not specifically part of the hardware, that hardware is essentially not hardware anymore. It's now a license. It's a bundle of parts that may have value as, hard, as um, pieces of metal and plastic, but it isn't a complete device. So the problems that we see with contracts are ones that states can resolve. And that is, it, you should be able to command that manufacturers have their contracts be clear, fair, and reasonable. And most of these contracts are not. Most of them wind up creating repair monopolies. And that's where um, several cases have come to court that have agreed in the federal system that these are in fact monopolies. GE just lost a case about six months ago for having monopolized repair of medical anesthesia equipment. Uh, they don't brag about that, and you won't see a lot about it, but they're, they're going to be paying $143 million in damages. And for GE, that's not a lot, but for the independent repair companies, that's very, very big. Another case that goes back a couple of years involved Avaya, who is a telephone manufacturer, and uh, they sued one of their former business partners. The business partner countersued for um, monopoly, and they won. And unfortunately, Avaya has gone bankrupt, so they don't have the money yet. But I'm just giving you this as a context of these are true monopolies. They meet the test of unfair and deceptive contracts in state law, and they are also poss possibly you could litigate them in federal court, but consumers aren't good at that. Um, my organization couldn't possibly do that. We looked at it, and there's thousands of manufacturers doing the same thing. So we want to alert everybody that this is a problem of monopolies, and those are essentially unfair, um, undesirable, and they hurt the free market. Um, we need a free market. We need competition for repair. I'd like to go a little bit longer, if you don't mind. So I know that there's concerns um, generally raised in these, in these hearings about intellectual property and proprietary rights. Um, I brought with me, and I'll, I, it's a stack, it's quite a large stack of documentation from the U.S. Copyright Office that came out of two studies done specific to the issues of copyright um, law and repair. Uh, one of them says, they kind of punt the whole issue saying, well, uh, copyright law is just fine the way it is. Repair is already legal under Section 117. It's legal as fair use. It's legal as c'est not fair, it's, I, it's a big document, and I've highlighted a couple of the statements, and they basically kick the ball back to the states, saying copyright law is just fine, it protects IP just fine, and all the problems that we're having out in the field uh, among consumers are resolvable in state contract law. The second one deals specifically with the exemption process for requesting exemptions of the Copyright Office. Um, that's done every three years. We're in the middle of a new one now, and that's where you wound up getting permission from the Copyright Office to do things like unlock cell phones, to do things like tinker with, um, that's all software tinkering issues. And if the Copyright Office says it's okay, it's okay. And nothing that's done here changes any of that. So there are really two separate efforts going on. One is a contract effort to make sure that consumers are buying what they think they buy and they have fair and reasonable expectations of what that means. And the other is a copyright law issue, which is being worked on in Congress and in the Copyright Office. Thank you. Yes. So I have the honor of leading a local nonprofit called Tech Dump and Tech Discounts. And we have a business model of using electronics recycling and refurbishing as a means of workforce development, specifically for adults facing some sort of barrier to employment. In 2017, we trained 86 people with a history of incarceration and addiction on technology, unwanted technology that still had plenty of life in it and did not need to go to a landfill. Last year, we processed over 4 million pounds of electronics. The interesting part of all of this is only 15% of that by weight could actually be repaired and refurbished because of the lack of ability to purchase repair parts and repair manuals for these items. So last year, we sold hundreds of thousands of electronics, refurbished and repaired computers, cell phones, other devices, and repair manuals and parts would have allowed us to do much more and to train many more people. And that's because repair creates amazing amounts of jobs, far more than recycling. So I mentioned that we refurbished about 15% by weight. That makes up 50% of our employee base. And we're a small organization. We're just one of many, many in the state of Minnesota where we're creating local jobs, local jobs that increase the ability to make affordable technology, not just for adults 
or individuals that are needing to, to use that technology to be successful in the workplace and education as individuals, but also to allow small business owners to be able to buy affordable technology. Last week, we had a customer named Lori that came in with an iPad, an iPad that was being used on a medical mission trip in Haiti, and unfortunately, the screen was cracked, and it costs well, the estimate was $300 to have the broken screen replaced, which you could go and just buy a new iPad instead, which I would say is the intention of our current challenge. If we truly own our electronics, we have to be able to access repair parts and repair manuals to purchase them, whether independent repair shops, whether individuals. I love being able to take my vehicle to my local repair shop in Hopkins, Minnesota called Dale Festi and know that they can get whatever they need. And we want to be able to do the same as a repair shop of electronics. Thank you very much. So members, as we're coming up, uh, what we're going to be providing here in the next couple of presenta presentations is, our testifiers is, businesses, small businesses, Minnesota businesses that are impacted by the current lack of, of ability to get these repair manuals, patches, uh, equipment, and that kind, of, uh, that kind of equipment. So on my uh, left, um, you're not David Larson. <laughs> We switched. You switched. Okay. Why don't you introduce yourself and uh, start your testimony. Hi. My name is Kyle Updahl. I'm a uh, small business owner. I own CPR, cell phone repair. I have uh, 12 locations under my ownership. Um, uh, 11 of those are in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, I function independently from, as a CPR franchisee, but have their full support to be here today. Um, Minnesota franchise CPR stores repaired 35,000 plus uh, devices last year for Minnesotans. All Minnesotans are roughly within three miles of a three mile radius of our locations. We're, our goal is to continue to expand our locations and help service that customer today that doesn't have the option to be close to five of the Apple stores in market today. Um, outstate markets such as St. Cloud and Duluth are in our future. Um, in addition to that, we service uh, hundreds of hundreds of uh, I'm sorry, we, we service several Fortune 100 companies locally. We offer quick, fast, typically same day repair, which the manufacturer is unable to provide to these businesses today. Um, we also work with um, the Minnesota State Government. We're a licensed vendor. We've fixed, we've fixed tablets for local penitentiaries, um, local police, local fire departments. Um, it's something that these businesses, businesses and government uh, um, offices cannot be without devices for a short, short amount of time, so we're an asset to them. Um, collectively, our franchise employ close to 40 employees in the Twin City metro area, and uh, this, these jobs are specific to um, typically millennials in the 20 to 25 year, year age, or age um, that are looking for a career, and they're using us as a step to their next, to their next career. Um, it may be of interest in our experience, we are seeing people use phones for a much longer period of time than previously. Um, three and a half years is pretty common now. We're seeing a lot of iPhone 6s. So people are not spending the money to always go to the latest, latest and greatest device. They're looking for the opportunity to repair. Um, with respect to the right to repair law, I'll point out that today, we, to, today at CPR, we do not have access to many of the materials and OEM parts that come from manufacturers' devices that we repair. Um, this documentation and access to the parts would greatly improve our ability to timely and accurately complete the, the, the repairs we perform. At CPR, we have a corporate ISO 9001 certification program that we come up with on our own. So we research video, we look at any, we look at devices, we break them down, and we share that information among stores to make sure that we're doing the best for our consumer. But we lack any official manufacturer tooling and do not have access to these items, which make it more difficult for the repairs. And even though we don't have that access, we do stand by a lifetime warranty, so we work extra hard to make sure that our customers' devices are repaired quickly. In closing, I see the local repair shops such as CPR franchise, uh, such as our CPR franchisees to, to surprise to, I'm sorry, to provide a value add to the manufacturers of the industry. We keep their customers using the devices. We view ourselves like an auto mechanic shop um, that basically anybody can go to. 
I go to Gary at North Oaks Auto because he, he's close to my home. His prices are reasonable, and the service and experience I get is exceptional. That's my goal as a business owner, and I want my fellow Minnesotans and all Americans to have the right to repair the products they purchased with their hard-earned money anywhere they choose with the confidence that the manufacturer has provided. The manuals, guides, and tooling, and access available to the public to ensure fast, affordable, accurate, and successful repair. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually filling in for Mr. Larson today. I'm Thomas Craddock. Thomas Craddock. Sure. Um, I'm Thomas Craddock. Um, I work at Vibrant Technologies. I'm the tech center and warehouse manager. I oversee about 40 people in a company of about 70. Um, my team and I, we experience issues brought up by this bill on a daily basis. Um, one example that we just had last week, uh, we just had a very big IBM machine that came in that we purchased to test new components, uh, Power 8. IBM Power 8 is kind of the newest technology that they have out right now. Um, we, uh, uh, we bought memory for it that we needed to test. The difference being uh, this was DDR4 memory, newest, latest, and greatest, and the machine supports DDR3 and DDR4. Um, in order to test this memory, we actually came to find out that I needed a different firmware level to bring it up to the newest and greatest to even work this memory, which I don't have access to because I don't have my, uh, I don't have my machine under maintenance. So I am stuck at my firmware level, and even though the fix is out there for me to be able to test this memory, I have to pay them for the fix. Um, to kind of give an example in more layman's terms and go on with the, the auto industry type of uh, terms we've been going with, um, it's kind of like if I bought a, a new wheels and tires for my car, but as soon as I put it on, my car shuts off, and then I have to go to Ford, and I have to pay them in order to put wheels and tires on my car. It kind of does, doesn't make any sense. Um, another example would be um, we just, so like there's, we, I have Arrowhive access points and there's this big security flaw uh, recently. Uh, you can, you have to Google, I forget exactly what it was called, but basically everything always ends up having a back door into it and firmware will patch these back doors, it'll close them. But Essentially, this is a manufacturer defect that I have to then go back after I've already paid for the equipment to fix. That usually is just given, like in an auto industry, it would be a, a recall. When your car gets recalled, I don't expect to bring my car in and actually have to pay to have them put in what was wrong in the beginning. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Schaefer, and I think we'll have time for probably another testifier if somebody else would like to come up and testify uh, on behalf of the bill. Mr. Schaefer, announce your name and go ahead with your testimony, please. I'm Tim Schaefer, and I'm the Director of Environment Minnesota. <coughs> We're a citizen-based environmental advocacy <coughs> organization that represents thousands of members across the state who share our belief that there's something special about Minnesota, something worth protecting. I'm here to express support for fair repair because we can and should reduce waste by making it easier to repair our own things. Um, my fellow testifiers have already highlighted the barriers to repair, so I'm going to highlight a few facts that I feel underscore the environmental problem and the absurdity of continuing to allow these barriers to repair. E-waste is a growing concern. The EPA estimated that in 2010, Approximately 350,000 mobile phones were thrown out each day. And Pew estimates that phone ownership grew from 80% to 95% in that same time frame. So we likely throw out significantly more phones today. E-waste contains toxic materials. It's estimated that 40% of the heavy metals in our landfills come from discarded electronics, according to EP, a green electronic rating system. But unfortunately, e-waste is very hard to recycle. Only 12.5% of e-waste is recycled, according to the EPA. And finally, by far the largest environmental impact of consumer electronics is in manufacturing, not in use. 81% of a desktop computer's energy use is in making it, and the rest is in using it. So by far the easiest, cheapest way to address these problems is to keep these products in use when we can. And there are, as you can see, numerous people who are want, willing to do this work and happy to do this work. So we're only asking for a little help to solve this problem for ourselves. 
And frankly, there just isn't a good reason why we shouldn't have the information and parts that we need to fix the devices we already have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other testifiers that would like to come forward? Uh, we have about four more minutes that we can take testimony on uh, in favor of the bill. So if somebody else would like to come forward. Uh, if nobody else would like to come forward, uh, Senator Osmond. Uh, I'd just like to tell a story, too, about why this is important. Um, I visited a number of, of these locations that are running into these problems. One is called Ocean Tech. They're in Eden Prairie. And I was amazed at seeing their operation. But more importantly, uh, they brought me to a back room where they had a stack of servers about yay high on pallets. And these were servers that had come off of a Fortune 100 company. And what they were doing was is retooling, retasking them. They were not state of the art, but they were retooling and retasking them for a school district in Alabama. So Minnesota can be on the front leading edge of this industry if we take advantage of being the first ones to be at the front of this. Uh, by doing that, not only are, are we retasking and retooling something that still has life in it, we're also saving our money in our school districts or to public services that don't need top of the line. School districts just need it for storage and email services. Uh, they don't necessarily need it for something like my company particularly needs, United Health Group, where they need you know terabytes of data and processing speeds to be able to keep up with the healthcare industry. So by making these, putting, have, by having more value, everybody wins. The company that sells these products to Ocean Tech wins because they get to recoup money back into their company for the, for the hardware that they're, they're disposing of, making it easier for them to buy the more, most latest and greatest option in computing from IBM or uh, what other manufacturer. But also the taxpayer in this particular case benefits from having a good product, not state of the art, but something that services for what they really need. So there are no losers in this episode, they're only winners. And uh, there, I know that some people will say, well, you're blowing the warranty on these machines. Well, what happens at Ocean Tech is they put their own warranty, they put their, their their mouth behind their product to say, we are going to warranty this because if they can't make a good product, they're going to be out of business. So it's not just that the, I, the other warranties are gone. They're warrantying it separately, saying we will stand behind our product. So if we can be in Minnesota on the front lines of this, I think we can develop, just like Medtronic has developed into one of the worldwide leaders in medical devices. And incidentally, this bill is going to be exclusionary of medical devices because there's, there's federal law. Besides, I don't want you know, Joe's repair shop fixing a pacemaker that has in, you know, eccentricities that might be problematic. But we could be that repair, fun, uh, that repair focus in the United States or the world by being the front on the front line of this. So I appreciate your time and uh, I'd be happy to call up the rest of the witnesses that might not be necessarily totally in favor of this bill. And we, this is a work in progress. I'm happy to work with all the people uh, and that, that are maybe not in favor of it to try and get a bill that would be workable here in Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Osmick. And I think the next uh, part we'll go to questions uh, uh, with your testifiers. So. Uh, if you want to be the one that handles the questions and use the phone a friend process, the phone a friend process, or if you want to have some of your testifiers come up, whichever you feel most comfortable. We'll see doing. what you lob at me. Okay. Well, right off the bat, uh, can you talk to us about data privacy concerns uh, that might arise with this bill? Um, I don't believe there would necessarily be data privacy uh, issues. I think there could be copyright questions. Uh, there may be some, again, of my testifiers that may be able to speak more to this. Uh, the privacy, you know, if there is privacy issues, that should be put behind encrypted uh, types of encryption on these machines that if they have to have privacy. Uh, keep in mind, like with the servers, they are wiped clean before they get to the server location. And then Ocean Tech actually wipes them clean a second time to make sure that there are no PHI, PII, uh, privacy issues on those machines. Thank you. Uh, members, questions? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Oh, hold Chairman. Hold on a second. I, gotta, I can finish it with a better answer. Uh, okay. <laughs> I thought I got it, but I heard a volunteer. Just from, uh, this is something that comes up often from uh, my retail stores for cell phone repair. 
we often get customers that use their phone day in, day out. They have pictures, they have data that they do not want anybody else to see. And uh, Could you we don't want to announce your name for the record, sir. I'm sorry. My name is Kyle Updahl with CPR Cell Phone Repair. Thank you. Go ahead. At our retail stores, we get often asked the question um, Do you need access to anything to fix my device? That includes laptops, phones, tablets, uh, gaming systems, et cetera. We do not need passwords or any of that information in order to repair a device. What we need is the device, and we basically need the parts to replace it. If a customer wants to verify that everything works correctly, we ask them to enter their password, and they can go through a quality check to verify that everything works. We can walk them through that. We have a minimum of 15-point checklist. Most repair shops do. Um, and then, and then if uh, otherwise, if they feel comfortable leaving a password, we can quality check it for them, or they can enter it themselves. But it is not a requirement for physical hardware device repair in our repair shops today to enter passwords. Thank you, Mr. Oakdahl. Uh, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Osmick, um, as I've been listening to this, uh, I'm trying to determine if your bill would require a visit to our Judiciary Committee. And the reason I ask that is, is that I've heard the word copyright, we've talked about contract law, and we may even be getting into patent law. And um, could you give me some kind of assurance uh, or perhaps describe what issues might be important to consider in the, at least those three areas or maybe some other areas that I'm not thinking about right now? that would affect a judicial issue. Senator Osmick. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, yes, I would expect that if, if and when at some point in time that the Commerce Committee, which would be the primary jurisdiction over this bill, if at some point in time this did move forward, that it would take a spin through the Judiciary Committee to, to vet out those particular issues. Um, uh, I believe Gay is here. Yep. She yep. can mo maybe speak more globally to those copyright and infringement issues. Mm -hmm. If you would uh, yeah, basically if you, if you we introduce yourself. Again. Sorry, yeah. Gay Gordon Byrne okay. from the Repair Association. Thank you. Go for it. Um, the origin of this bill is automotive right to repair. We we basically copied it, and all of those issues were hammered out over an extensive period of time by the auto industry and the aftermarket industry who all have very extensive interest in protecting copyrights, patents, and trade secrets. So yes, you should run it through your, your experts, but what you will find is that the auto industry basically hammered through all of these issues. And what, what this bill does has nothing to do with copyright law, because it can't. It can't do anything to patent law. And by the way, patents aren't infringed by repair at all. That's considered fair use. And the only way you infringe on a patent is to manufacture something without the permission of the patent holder. So repair is definitely not how you infringe on a patent. And then trade secrets um, come up often. And again, the auto industry went with a standard of referencing the Uniform Trade Secrets Act of federal law, saying if, it's, if it falls under this definition of a trade secret, it's not, it's not going to be provided to the independent repair facility or the owner. And one of the interesting things is there's a guess uh, or an assumption that uh, producing service manuals or diagnostic tools is somehow trade secret. And the real answer is by creating these tools and documentation for technicians, even the employers, even the manufacturer's own employees, that act of publication and distribution ends any possible trade secret claim. So the analogy I like to use is the repair tech fixing a beverage dispenser does not need the formula for Coca-Cola. Um, and that usually, we wind up getting through those issues pretty easily. Mr. Kreidick. Uh, he had more uh, answers to your original question on uh, the, uh, the, the the question you did. Yeah, yep, data in available. Uh, before we go to that, did you have a follow-up, Senator Limmer? Uh, no, I did not. Thank you. Go uh, ahead, uh, sir, and announce your name. Thomas Craddock. Um, to kind of follow up on the data erasure part, uh, at Vibrant Technologies, we get a lot of uh, enterprise-level hard drives that come through, and the way that we data wipe those is we use software such as Blanco, uh, Blanco, we can pick different types of way to wipe it. The same way uh, anyone in the industry does it. I mean, even with like 
HP comes out, they're going to wipe the drives the same way, which is typically your DOD three-pass standard, which is it writes zeros, ones, and random numbers on all this. And uh, the idea is you put information on top of information and you erase it three different times, and it becomes completely unreadable. Um, in the event, say, a uh, hard drive just won't even work, but it, the data's still there, we go as far as completely and utterly destroying it so that no one could possibly p place it, get it back together. And we've even gone as far as sending it out to uh, like data recovery agencies that their specialty is to you know try to pull things off of broken hard drives and stuff like that. Um, we've you know we've done like a DoD three pass wipe and we wanted to verify that we're doing it correctly and we've sent it out to these companies and they weren't able to pull anything off of it. Thank you. Uh, how do we ensure that these? As, as a sense, unofficial repair technicians do not compromise uh, personal information. Um, it's sort of, well, there, there's two answers to that. One is, you know, when you're retasking some of these pieces of equipment, uh, you're completely wiping away all information on these drives and then reformatting them. So they're basically, you're, you're taking everything from a functional human down to a baby and then rebuilding it. So. There, are, there would be no problems I would envision with uh, new, when you're taking new equipment and retasking it. it the repair functionality uh, that we've sort of already discussed previously is that you know, we're not, th this would not be going behind any firewalls or any passwords being used that would be protecting that type of integrity of, of data behind the scenes. Uh, only in the result of, in the in particular case you heard about, is if somebody want, if you wanted the agency who's repairing it to test it, would they be able to do that service for you if you wanted it? Uh, I don't necessarily see a problem with privacy at all unless you personally gave passwords in behind the scenes, then you're actually providing the information and being subjected to this because you voluntarily gave the password up. Thank Most you. of these repair shops are not going in that direction. This is simply, the screen is broken. The uh, something inside of the hard drive is broken. Something, or or in in many cases, you're just completely retooling and retasking it, wiping it clean to be used by a different user. Thank you, Senator Grand. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Osmick, for bringing this bill forward. I know it's controversial, and uh, and I too uh, have have mixed feelings as far as the the need and the approach, and and I have concerns from. Um, the privacy and, and all of those things that have been mentioned previously, but I think that I think we need to work really hard to come up with a, a happy medium or some type of compromise because I think the industry, from a technology perspective, my personal experience has led that it's been very challenging um, in trying to get a device serviced and in the critical need, uh, you and I and everybody in this room depends on this device for our, for our both of our professional lives, our personal lives. And I had, in fact, I think I had uh, during the end of the last session, <laughs> I had a cell phone go out on a Friday morning. And it took me literally all day, it, it, all day. And I, I, can't, I couldn't afford not to get it repaired. I think we were in, uh, in the throes of a special session. And, and there is no quick replacement for that communication device. We don't have alternatives. You can't just easily qu and quickly go get a new different phone with all the features and functionality. I've got work security on here. That just doesn't come out, you know, you just can't quickly get that redone. So it took me all day. And so I think the consumer demand has, has not been met by a good majority of the, of the manufacturers and, and providers of the devices because proximity, I think uh, one of the <coughs> testifiers said, you know, they're within three and a half miles of, of most of the, uh, the metro area. Uh, my only option was, and I live in North Branch, Minnesota, on a Friday was to drive to Maple Grove, was the only facility, manufacturer approved facility that could even attempt to, to diagnose, diagnose the repair um, as well as make the repair. And luckily, you know, it, it, it did work, but it literally started at 8 in the morning, and I didn't get home until 6 p.m. that night. And that was after multiple stops and spent sitting for four or five hours on the phone to first off try to get the, the one who sold me the phone to, to figure out the problem, then to have it pushed off to the manufacturer who then tries to push it back to the, to the, uh, to the phone provider, and then to realize that they don't have any service facilities in the, uh, in the metro area. And so I think it's a huge deficiency. Uh, and then when I got to that one facility, um, there was four or five people in line, two staff members, which was wonderful, but they had one computer. 
a hardware manufacturer had one computer. They should have two staff and ten computers because each each device repair required a, its own computer in, in time. Um, and so technology can be challenged. And so I think I think that's where we have to have a happy medium. And so I would encourage everybody in here, I know in both for and against this, that we've got to figure this problem out because our demand and our dependency on this to function, our commerce, our personal lives is, is fully dependent on this functioning every day. That's all I Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Cran, and thank you, uh, Senator Osmick. Uh, we're at that point. Uh, one quick wrap up, wrap up yep. and then we'll move forward. And somewhat in response, thank you, Mr. Chair, somewhat in response to Senator, uh, the Senator's comments. Um, we have been working on this going back a couple of years. Uh, if uh, For those of us who were here, we did actually have a directive to, um, I forget which agency it is, to have a stakeholders meeting, which we did. The problem that we have is that some uh, industries do not want to participate. <clears throat> and I appreciate your comments and that we have to have buy-in and I want to have peace in the valley. I want to have every senator vote yes on this uh, to do go in the right direction for Republican versus Democrat, rural versus uh, metropolitan, because I think this is a, a, an important issue uh, that we have to keep working on. This is not this is a work in progress, but I do say this. Every industry has to be willing to come to the table and not just stick their head in the sand. We have to start <clears> down this path. And if you want to stick your head in the sand, don't be surprised when something happens you don't like. Uh, I don't go in that direction. I want to have something we can all agree with. Thank you, Senator Osmick, and thank your testifiers for coming in. Thanks. And that will conclude this side of it. Uh, next, we'll start with uh, those folks that are testifying against a bit, the bill. and. Uh, Mr. Quillis and uh, Ms. McCabe, if you would come forward. And if you Morning, would please Mr. announce yourself. Chairman, and... members of the committee, my name is Tony Quillis, and I have the honor of representing uh, the Computing Technology Industry Association, better known as CompTIA or CompTIA. It is a uh, nonprofit industry trade association that represents uh, over 2,000 manufacturers across um, the United States. I want to thank you for the opportunity this morning to comment on Senate File 15. And before I get started, um, there's been some references to it, but I would like to thank Senator Osmick um, for his open door policy. Him and I have been having this discussion now, I think, for two or three years. He has always had an open door policy to discuss this issue, and as he referenced, has put together stakeholder meetings in person through cell phone uh, meetings that we've put together, and I want to thank him for that. He has always been um, very open to suggestions. Unfortunately, we have not been able to reach consensus, um, believe it or not, on this particular issue. But Mr. Chairman, I'd like to point out by mentioning the scope of the products that we're talking about. I want to thank Senator Asmick for the A3 amendment because originally this bill would have even talked about um, John Deere tractors, uh, coffee pots, uh, washers and dryers, the way that we were talking about that. But right now we've limited things down to a nine inch screen, which is what you see in front of you right now. My mini iPad is a nine inch screen. But I've also looked, just this past weekend, uh, looking at some articles, the Consumer Electronics Show was this weekend in Las Vegas. Um, and in the internet of things, um, these screens are changing uh, daily, if not monthly. Um, one of the pictures I saw was a refrigerator now. will tell you whether your milk is out or you need water. And the screen on that refrigerator was about this big. So we're talking about refrigerators too, besides um, smartphones, iPads, televisions, computers, printers. Uh, through the amendment, we've taken medical devices out, um, as I said, toys, refrigerators. But I just wanted to, you to know that the, the breadth of what we're talking about here when we talk about the right to repair. The second point I'd like to make is what is available right now to consumers in Minnesota? Right now, the original equipment manufacturers, or OEM as they're called, have facilities in the state and you can take uh, a product to them um, for repair or look to be looked at for something such as a cracked screen. The retailer where you purchase that product, whether it be a Walmart, a, a Target, a Best Buy, also um, would be able to take that back to. There are mail-in programs for certain products from certain manufacturers available, but to Senator Coran's point, 
most of us need it now. Um, and you could probably talk to Kyle afterwards. I'm sure he's got a facility up in Blaine that he'd love to help you out. And Senator Limmer would probably like to thank you for going to Maple Grove and <laughs> frequenting his, his uh, legislative district. But also those mail-in programs, but those don't work all the time for everybody. Usually we need them right now. But there are certified authorized repair facilities in Minnesota. My list is two years old, but there were 64 of them in Minnesota located that were authorized either by Apple, Hitachi, Toshiba, Samsung, uh, located in Minnesota. As you've heard in testimony from folks today, there are independent repair facilities. Kyle's facility are available. The cell phone repair folks are out there. Um, so there are other ones out there. Service providers also provide update and take back options for certain products. Um, but we just wanted to make you aware of those product, you know, those options that are available right now without Senate File 15. Um, as we all do, when we ever have a situation, we go to Google. Uh, yesterday, when I Googled how to fix my iPhone, uh, I couldn't find it for iPhone 8 or 10 yet, but I found manuals and videos for how to repair crack screens and home buttons on iPhones on Google. Um, it's either through reverse engineering, but they're available right now. So if you wanted to do it, you can go ahead and do it online, and those options are available. Um, there have been, just wanted to let you know though, through all of this, the manufacturer's key are, we want to ensure our quality, the safety, and the security of our products are insured. Um, there have been 12 other states that have looked at this uh, legislation like this. Uh, none, of, none of them have passed. Um, and just two things, um, a couple other things real quick. We were concerned about some of the proprietary trade information that we've discussed here a little bit. Um, that is taken care of a little bit in the amendment in the A3, but also it creates a little bit of an unlevel playing field for those 64 certified authorized repair dealers out there right now. They have gone through taking the time and the commitment to be certified by those manufacturers. And now these other um, if this bill would pass, these other folks, these other independent folks would be able to get this information for free and not have gone through and taken the time or the commitment that some of these authorized dealers have gone through. Um, there are some concerns also about warranty, security breaches, and liability issues, but I think those would be probably left um, for the Judiciary Committee. But Mr. Chairman, finally to wrap up before I turn it over to Lisa, you know, manufacturers and the members of CompTIA spend millions if not billions of dollars uh, in research and development to develop these products. And uh, it's very important that they have uh, reliable and reputable brands. Branding is a big deal, uh, as you can imagine. And so the concern about the brand as well as the security, the safety, and the qualities in products uh, is very important to us. So. We also think that besides that brand and the reliability that um, we already go through and we would mandate and duplicate already existing programs, like I said, that exist on uh, Google and other um, facilities that exist here in Minnesota. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to turn it over to, to Ms. McCabe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Coase. Ms. McCabe, if you would introduce yourself for the mic and then uh, go ahead and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Lisa McCabe and I'm with CTIA, the Trade Association for the uh, wireless communications industry. Um, I, I echo um, the comments that Tony uh, made and, and also say that we do believe that this legislation could lead to unintended consequences that could have a negative effect on the operation security and safety of electronic products. Um, agreements between manufacturers and their authorized repair networks could be undermined by this bill and we could lose some of the quality assurances that are for consumers through this process of having contracts between authorized um, repair and manufacturers. Also, um, we, we, as mentioned, we do have concerns that mandating the disclosure of the, all of the information required, uh, mandated in the bill, could lead to the disclose, disclosure of proprietary information that could vi violate uh, federal and state, uh, federal copyright protection and state trade um, laws, as, as has been mentioned. And as you've heard today, there are numerous options for consumers when their phone, um, when, when they want to get a device um, repaired. A lot of people spoke today with um, talking about a very vibrant um, community that exists in the repair. 
Um, and with respect to the security and safety, we think that this legislation could weaken privacy and security features on various electronic products. Um, smart co smartphones, computers, servers, consumer electronics, and other connect connected devices are always at risk of hacking. So by having all this information out there, weakening the privacy and security protections could put consumers at risk. Um, access to all this technical information, criminals could um, more easily be able to circumvent security protections, harming not only the, um, the product owner, but also everyone who uses um, the network on which they're connected. Um, consumers do need reasonable insurance that things are done, are going to be done appropriately, and that devices will be fixed securely and um, safely and correctly. State law should not mandate that all manufacturers must provide a how-to manual um, for, a, for any product and provide it to anyone who asks. Um, we, the authorized repair networks are really there to provide consumers assurance that their products are serviced properly and, are tr and the people who are working them on the, these products are trained and vetted repair professionals that have the skills to safely and um, reliably repair the electronics. Um, they understand the intricacies of the products and have sent, spent time procuring the knowledge to, to fix them appropriately. Um, it also ensures that the, the, the correct procedures and, they ha and they're using the correct parts to make sure that, um, that this will be done according to the manufacturer specifications to maintain the brand of the product and also to, to make sure that it continues to operate appropriately. Um, the bill does not provide any, any, any protections for consumers, repair shops, or manufacturers. Um, when, a, when a electronic product breaks, we, we have said that there are many um, opportunities for consumers that they have. Unauthorized repair, authorized repair, a lot of independent repair shops that, that were here today. Um, we think that, um, that there is a vibrant marketplace out there, and we, but we do need to make sure that the compliance and infor, um, inf compliance accountability that protects consumers is part of the legal contract between um, authorized repair and the manufacturer. Manufacturers make significant invest investments in the development of their products and services to protect, um, and the protection of the intellectual property is very a legitimate and important aspect of sustaining the vibrant and innovative technology industry. However, this legislation puts at risk intellectual properties that, man that manufacturers have developed. Providing unauthorized repair facilities and individuals with access to proprietary information without the contractual safeguards that are currently in place between manufacturers and authorized repair could place manufacturers, suppliers, distributors, and the repair network at risk. Um, as, as was mentioned, no other state has passed this bill because they understand that it's unnecessary in this um, vibrant marketplace and that there are many risks and concerns that come about with this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCabe. Uh, Mr. Newstead, if you would like to announce your name and uh, proceed with your testimony. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Bruce Newstead. I work for the members of the Minnesota Retailers Association. We're a collection of about 1,200 storefronts across the state of Minnesota from the smallest of the small to some of the quite largest, actually. Um, our interest in this issue, you might think, is interesting. Why do retailers care? Uh, our interest really centers around the customer, which probably was what makes sense. Uh, and we have two pieces that uh, concern us or uh, make us think about this issue. For Senator Osmick, thank you for continuing the conversation. Uh, and one of those pieces, is there enough access to repair facilities? That is a legitimate question. And I won't uh, repeat what you've heard today relative to access to qualified repair shops. Uh, but generally, we feel like there is... Um, good consumer access to repair and repair facilities today. Secondarily, though, is back to that consumer, the idea that what the consumer expects and how that interacts with the retailer. Certainly the manufacturer makes the product, uh, but the retailer uh, sells the product. And that's why, Senator, you went back to your carrier right away where you bought your cell phone from and said, how do I fix this? 
Um, so we have a real concern or um, interest in the safety of the repair process, the security of the repair process, the quality of the repair process, and the warranty that is impacted. Certainly timing is one of those issues as well, but we tend to find that consumers will default to safety, security, quality, and warranty uh, over time. Uh, they'll certainly pick the quality of the product over the slight convenience or inconvenience. So in that process, um, it's, it's our job to make sure actually manufacturers are providing good positive repair facilities that know how to do their job that ensure that safety, security, quality, and warranty. And that's our other interest in this issue. And today we would submit um, that the manufacturers have a pretty decent process in that area. Uh, certainly willing to continue the conversation as to what that might look like in the future. I do want to say we support, just like we support local retailers, we certainly support local repair shops too. Uh, we just want to make sure there's a strong integrity of that repair process that meets the expectation of the consumer. Thank you, Mr. Newstead. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left. If somebody else would like to testify against the bill, bill I certainly feel free to come forward. Uh, if nobody else is coming forward, we'll move into the question. If you have some comments, and then we'll go into the questions. Senator Osmick, any comments before we go into the questions? Um, just a couple. Um, when we're talking about um, not having availability of patches, uh, and that there was, you know, concerns brought up regarding if you didn't, you know, if you, that these patches would be somewhat proprietary. The problem is, is that patches come out on every piece of software, every piece of equipment that you have, and having dealers or repair shops have access to patches actually strengthens the security and integrity of the product as opposed to reducing it. Um, and no one believes that IBM or other manufacturers are going to have to stand behind a warranty if an unwarranted or an un, uh, authorized dealer starts working on them. Matter of fact, those unauthorized dealers or repair shops, as I said before, put their own warranty saying that we will stand behind our product because if they do, if they do not provide a successful service, they'll be out of business all on their own. Um, so I think one other comment I'd like to make too is that when we talk about authorized repair shops, uh, some of these, and I've spoken with some of these um, businesses and they've said that we've tried to become authorized. The problem is, is that every time we apply, they're not accepting additional authorized dealers for whatever reason. So uh, I think that that's another possible topic of discussion in this bill is regulation on how you should be able to become an authorized dealer, go through all of the, the processes to become them if you choose to. So uh, I think there's a lot of work yet to be done. Um, this is not a finished product, and but I do want to make sure that the people, who, the organizations that are against this need to come to the table to find a way where we can continue this discussion and not, as I said before, stick, their, stick people's heads in the sand. Not people here at the table, but uh, people from, uh, let's say, out of state with uh, big things looking like an apple, I'm sorry, did I say that? Uh, on their machines don't want to have the discussion because they want to have a monopoly. And I think that there is room for everyone in this discussion. Oh, and with that, Senator Osmick, I guess my first question to the testifiers would be: uh, How hard is it? F how hard would it be for an independent technician to become an authorized uh, repair person? And is that a burdensome process? If somebody would like to take that question, I, I don't know. I mean, we there are many manufacturers out there, and each manufacturer has their own process by which to go through um, to become an authorized dealer. And I don't know the specific, the you know, specifics of the the timeline. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, members. Uh, questions, uh, Senator Lim. Chair, um, I was thinking of another industry while we were talking an industry involving the auto industry mm -hmm. and dealers versus the manufacturer of those dealers. And there's been an ongoing request through legislation <clears throat> to essentially alter the contract statutorily uh, in order to uh, give one party a little more flexibility with how that relationship works. And somehow this is kind of reflective of that same 
argument. But um, the question that comes up uh, at that last uh, decision, or that last, uh, the, the bill proposal that is still floating in the legislature, the major question is, is what is the role of the legislature? Should we interfere <coughs> with a contract uh, that's provided by two parties? Now, in this case, it's not necessarily a contract between two parties that exist, but it's um, a relationship that, at the very least, is protective of one party with a relatively new technology. At least the newest technology is mostly protected. And yet there are players out in the industry that are participating in it, and essentially they want uh, a more open path to a, a greater slice of the pie. And so uh, I think that'll probably become more of a major, to, major consideration by the legislature. How far do we play in this, uh, this discussion? And uh, so it's more of a philosophic approach that I want to satisfy because what happens here is once we start doing this, other contracts, other relationships between manufacturers and businesses are not going to be settled in the courts, they're going to be settled in the legislature. And that puts at least myself at a very awkward spot. Now, if there is an abuse uh, to an existing contractual relationship or an informal relationship uh, that we're talking about, uh, that will have to be proven uh, if the abuse is so flagrant that it creates harm. And so as we progress down this path, I'm hoping that the advocates of the bill would address more of a philosophic approach and not so much a technical one. Well, thank you, Senator Limmer. Uh, did you have any follow-up? Uh, no. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Senator Cran, any comments? Uh, thank you. Uh, there being no other questions, uh, thank you folks for coming in and testifying on both sides of the bill. Thank you, Senator Osmick, for presenting the bill. And uh, we will uh, call the meeting to close.